As much as life has changed over the last year, you're still pretty busy, so consider convenient COVID-19 testing from Quest. Get the same tests hospitals use without a doctor visit. Simply order online, select from drive through or at-home options, and get results sent securely to your phone or computer. It's a great fit for your busy life. With over 25 million COVID-19 tests processed, you can count on Quest. So order your test today at questcovid19.com. That's questcovid19.com. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, at your own pace. Learn how to ace your opponent from Serena. Improve your writing skills with Neil Gaiman. Learn how to negotiate with Chris Voss. All right, those were the courses I chose, but you'll have over 90 classes to make your own choice, and they're all taught by world-class instructors. Now, of course, the master instructor, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, has a master class of his own on scientific thinking and communication, and we all know how important that is in these times. I'm not the only one who's benefiting from my master class. My brother is an avid tennis player, and I sent him the gift of a subscription so he could get schooled by Serena. Did I tell him that it was a part of my subscription? Well, let's just say the answer rhymes with ho, ho, ho. From learning how to write anything from a book to a screenplay, to communicating with your boss, to how to make dinner worthy of a Michelin star or just the best scrambled eggs this side of a jumpy chicken, there's a master class for you. I'm in the middle of a course on sex and communication because I'm good at one of those things. Masterclass is accessible on your phone, web, or smart TV. You can get an annual membership to Masterclass and give one to someone else for free. Get unlimited access to every Masterclass for you and a friend right now. Just go to masterclass.com slash startalkradio. That's masterclass.com slash startalkradio. Radio. Welcome to Star Talk, your place in the universe where science and pop culture collide. Star Talk begins right now. Welcome to Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and I've got with me my co host, Chuck Nice, and this is a special edition of Cosmic Queries, brought to you in partnership with. Pocket Lab. These are people that find all manner of reasons to gather together thousands of teachers around the world, which they did for this special live stream. And this presentation was called Science is Cool. We took their cosmic questions and turned it into a Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Check it out. Hey, everybody in virtual universe. <laughs> and hi, Dave. Good to be with you guys again. Guys, it's great to have you again. And, you know, as a testament to how much the audience really enjoys this, we got over a thousand questions. Can you imagine that? It will just go fast. We'll go it's going to go fast. It's amazing. Yeah, sound bite mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People love to, to ask you guys questions. So I'm going to mm -hmm. hand it off to you guys and I'll, I'll be back on uh, towards the end. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Okay. So, Chuck. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Good to see you again. Always a pleasure. Without a yeah, doubt. You're in LA right now, right? I am in Los Angeles. And uh, I'm in New York. So we got the, we got the whole country uh, we got the We got there. the country blanketed from end Blank to end. <laughs> end to end. Science. We have science across America right now. Oh, science across America. That's and we've got doing. many international uh, viewers from, yeah. uh, you know, I was going to say international from other countries. But that, of course, but that's, that means. I got you. You know, you know what we really need? We need, um, <laughs> what was it? Uh, when the Flat Earthers had a conference, it was, uh, and they were boasting that they had flat earth supporters all around the globe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should have been all around the disc. The disc. Thank okay, you, flat earthers. <laughs> Get <laughs> so you got to stop. So, so uh, let's hit about. I mean, I won't necessarily know the answers to these. I mean, I, you know, people, th these aren't even constrained by topic, right? They're just no. whatever, the, whatever, whatever people they want to ask you. This is my favorite. This is when I like it, you know. When people just come out and they ask you whatever is on their mind. Is it just galactic gumbo? Yeah, as you yeah. say. <laughs> That's right, the guarantee, the galactic gumbo. They <laughs> <laughs> don't see any guarantee. No, don't put on there now a little sign, little sign. Does everyone who makes gumbo speak like no. that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get right, to give it. Give it to me. Here we go. Hey, let's Bring it on. Let, uh, speaking of international, man, why not? Let, why not? Let's start this from um, 
little further down south, let's go to Bogota, Colombia. Bogota. Bogota. Yeah, and just before we begin, let me just establish my credentials here. I don't normally do this, but there might be new people to this, and I just want to say, okay, so I have an undergraduate degree in physics. I have a PhD in astrophysics. I'm widely read on many current scientific topics. I have various hobbies that inform back into my work, and I count myself as a lifelong learner ever since I graduated, um, ever, ever since I exited school. So any day that goes by where I, where I don't learn something, for me, feels like a wasted day. So often when I'm given an answer, I'm pulling from different places in, our, in, in my portfolio of knowledge and expertise which can flesh out an answer, maybe make it make make the answer a little more memorable to you. If I add a pop culture reference, uh, but I plus I spend some time thinking about pop culture, which folds back into this. So, so there you have it, Chuck. And if I don't know the answer, I'm just going to say I don't know. Okay, that's cool. And I, I guess I should give uh, my credentials too. I have um, read every um, issue of Scientific American this year, and that's just, it. Okay. <laughs> so let's. All right. Here we go. Jamie, uh, Jamie Cardozo. Jamie Cardozo wants to know this. This is a great question. Neil, what is the most beautiful and inspiring process in space? Wow. Wow. Okay. We start, like we're that. starting off. We're going yard. We're let's starting go, off let's go, big. let's go deep. We go mm, deep. Let's go baby. deep. Okay. By the way, most of our listeners might now might not be Americans, so we're not going yard, we're going meter. Okay. Oh. <laughs> going yard is an American football expression for either going, no, going yard, that's basketball. Uh, no, going yard is baseball for your, baseball you're for hitting going it out of the, the yard. Ball. There you go. So. Okay. Oh, it's you're hitting out of the, 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 oh, the ball yard. Yeah. Oh, it's not how many yards away it no. is. Okay. Fine. But fine. anyway, so, so I would say, what a great question. I would say on earth, because well, I'll go out into space in a minute, but I would say on earth, on everyone's bucket list, especially since in modern times, there's more traveling around the world than ever before. It used to be really rare if you left your country and went to another country, or if you got on an airplane, that was a newsworthy event. Now, it's a little more common, it's more affordable. On everyone's bucket list should be to bear witness to a total solar eclipse. By happenstance, the size of the moon on the sky is the same as the size of the sun on the sky. Of course, the sun is much, much bigger, but it's also, but the sun is 400 times bigger and it's 400 times farther away. So they exactly cancel out so that they're the same size on the sky. So the moon passes in front of this. You can't see the moon because you're observing the backside of it. It's the other side is lit up by the sun. In broad daylight, the sun looks like it starts to disappear. And then the sun does disappear, and you have the beautiful corona, not the coronavirus, just the corona, which is Latin for crown, um, and, 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 it, and it lasts only a few minutes, so you travel all this way, and there's the anticipation. It's like a cosmic pilgrimage to participate in one of the great spectacles of the universe, a total solar eclipse. I've seen two, one when I was, uh, I was 14, the first time I saw one. And I saw the one that came across the United States just a few years ago. But uh, total solar eclipses happen every couple of years. So they're not rare. By the way, practically every news article on eclipses say, rare eclipse coming by. No, they're not. They happen every couple of years. You don't say, rare World Cup is being played this year. No, it happens. At, that happens every four years. Eclipses are more common than the World Cup. Okay? So, but, but. Uh, uh, newspaper people and many other people want to believe that you're experiencing something that never happens ever and it's just happening in your lifetime when you happen to be here on earth. No, the point is eclipse paths are very narrow. So it's you got to put in some effort to get in the path of the moving shadow, all right? And usually it's in some exotic, interesting place in the world. Use that as an excuse to travel. So for me, it is beautiful, it is elegant, it drives you to poetry and Beyond that, if I could go anywhere in the universe, I would watch the collision of two galaxies, but have it happen in my own time scale, because that typically takes a half a billion years, and I don't live that long. So the next best thing we have are colliding galaxies on a computer, because you can speed up time. Go Google colliding galaxies, and oh my gosh, it's like a cosmic ballet 
choreographed by the forces of gravity as two spiral galaxies intersect and they feel each other's gravity completely across their diameter. And so the whole galaxy begins to distort. And then it, they overpack, they, they overtake each other, uh, they pass through each other, and then they come back and then they oscillate. We, we have these simulations. Go look, look on, uh, go Google it, colliding galaxies and you'll get some of the most beautiful simulations there ever was. I'd like to see that just dangling out there in space and live long enough to just watch it happen. So there you have it. There you go. And thank you very much, Neil, for uh, explaining where baby galaxies come from. <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, it's where, it's where train wreck galaxies yeah. end up. But they start out as two beautiful spiral galaxies, and they end up quite the mess when they're mess. done. And they're black holes typically merge in the middle. So they now have a, a monster black hole that's twice the monster mm -hmm. it used to be in either one. So, yeah, so there you have it. I'm just saying the imagery is um, very reminiscent of, um, you know, procreation. Really? Okay. <laughs> cosmic. Uh, cosmic cosmic procreation. Yeah. Well, yeah, even though that's not, I mean, st I, know, I know stars come out of nurseries, you know, I mean, they're yeah, stellar nurseries. But there are baby galaxies. They're, they're called uh, satellite galaxies. We have two. Uh, they're, you know, less than a tenth the mass of our own galaxy. And they, um, they're called the Magellanic Clouds. They're not really clouds, but right. that's evidence of what they thought they were when they were first observed, um, you know, 500 years ago. Um, when telescopes revealed that what they thought was a cloud um, resolved into a pastiche of stars that are co a collection of stars that orbit our own galaxy. Sweet. And uh, our evidence shows that galaxies over time, actually end up eating them. So we don't call it galactic procreation. We call it galactic cannibalism. Oh. Right? You can Google that. What? Galactic cannibalism. All right. All right, give me another. Okay, let's go to... Okay, yo, let's, uh, let's keep it international right here. Um, Hafez Mirza. Hafez Mirza. Coming to us from Malaysia. I'm going to ap apologize in advance for Chuck's I know, I know, ability I know, to pronounce I know that's, anybody's I, name. He tries. I, I, listen, I know it's he not your name, but here's the thing. Now you got a better name. <laughs> no, no, you got a name. Now you got a better a, a name. A Chuckified name. No, right. they'll decide whether it's better, okay? <laughs> it's got Chuckified. That's right. All right, All go right, on. Here we but go. he's trying, just let everyone to know. I love this. How does yeah. astronomy help civilization? How does astronomy have economic value. Ooh. 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 Okay. Uh, so let me start. Let me, let me get base on you here. Okay. All right. Everyone I know who dropped out of astrophysics graduate school and did not complete a PhD. Okay earns at least three times more money than any of the rest of us. So the talent, the, the skill set that you have as an astrophysicist, it's problem solving, it's mathematics, it's programming, it's taking large sets of data and making sense of it. That's hugely valuable in many other fields that are out there. In fact, Michael Bloomberg, the multi-billionaire turned mayor of New York City, one-time candidate for president of the United States, Michael Bloomberg, okay, studied physics and astronomy in college, okay, and, and, and engineering. And so then he went and uh, left, left that and went to Wall Street. He became the youngest partner at Solomon Brothers, the youngest partner, and his parents said, but you're not using your science degree. And then he left and founded his own company called Bloomberg Financial Markets. And his mother said, but you're not using your science degree. Then he turned that into a billion dollar multinational corporation. But you're not using your science degree. And the fact is, he was using his science degree the entire time. Don't think that when you go to college or, or study in, in a graduate school that the, the specific knowledge is what you're applying. No, no, no. You go to school to learn how to think. Okay? And I can give another example that's not even in the sciences. Let's say you're in an English class or a history class and you write a paper on Napoleon. Okay? Yeah, you'll know a lot about Napoleon, but really, that's not what will matter later on. What will matter later on is that you took a topic 
that you knew nothing about. You researched it. You composed words, paragraphs, ideas into coherent arguments, thoughts, analysis. That's what you attain when you exit school. In fact, you know what wisdom is? It's what's left over after you've forgotten all the details of what you were taught in the classroom. That's wisdom. So that was just for people who didn't become astrophysicists, all right? For those who do, there's a long history of the relationship between governments and astronomers. In fact, I, I wrote a whole book on this. This sounds like a plug for my book, but you asked the question. Who was it who asked it? Hey, you all asked the question. Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a weird thing because if you know the sky, that's the earliest form of navigation there was. Right. If you're going to sail, to explore, to conquer, to for, for whatever is your good or bad reasons why a country might want to explore beyond its borders, you need to know where you are on Earth and what time it is. And both of those factors come to you by an understanding of the night sky. And it goes way back into indigenous peoples and what they did from Australia to the Polynesians to the Native Americans. And it goes way back. Navigation. Some of the greatest navigational tools come from some of the oldest culture. And in, the, in, in the Middle East, Okay, in, in my museum, in my office, okay, I have a, an astrolabe, and there it is, multiple discs that you put on, depending on where you are. You hold it up, and there's a weight at the bottom, and it's a beautifully carved Arabic in the brass, and this is, people were doing this navigating in the dunes. You know why? Because there wasn't a street corner to say, okay, this is north and this is south, and I'm going to find grandma's house. All right. So, so the value of what an astrophysicist brings to the world is not so obvious to someone just thinking, oh, do you build a, a gadget that I can now buy in the store? We are enabling, we are enabling the world to function in ways that might otherwise feel and seem hidden. And by the way, this is just spillage from the rest of what we do which is talking about black holes and quasars. And, oh, by the way, some of us actually are studying asteroids. In fact, we just did a stop and go on an asteroid just a few days ago. Why? To kick up some dust, scoop it up, bring it back to Earth and study it. We have wars on Earth fighting over natural resources, uh, over limited natural resources that are basically unlimited on asteroids. So if you're one of these people who say, why are we done up there when we should be focusing down here? You know what you sound like to me? You're like the person in the cave. And I'm looking out the door. I, I peek out the door and I say, wow, there's a mountain over there. And there's valleys and there's streams. No, you can't explore. We have cave problems. Let's solve the cave problems first. Then I'll let you exit the front door. That's what you sound like if you are trying to say, this is a luxury. We have to do the important things uh, here on Earth. So, wow. So I, I'm sorry I get all screaming at you. No, don't, don't worry. I, I'm, it, it's all good I'm stuff. I'm like all in the lens. You know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, I, I love it. I mean, you know, it's the, okay. it's the same fervor that you hear from the guy on the street corner in New York City telling everybody that we're all going to die. But, I, oh, okay. but, but for some reason from you, it works. <laughs> no. Yeah, plus, I'm not saying we're all going to die. Right. I'm going to say the methods and tools of science actually provide us power over many things that would otherwise kill us. Excellent. We've got to take a quick break, but when we come back, more Cosmic Queries on Star Talk. Exploring the secrets of the cosmos is a fascinating pursuit, but have you discovered the vast and incredible potential of your own mind? Introducing Advanced Nootropic Formula from B Thrive, the Vitamin Shop brand. Available at vitaminshop.com or your local Vitamin Shop store. This stimulant-free formula supports cognitive function, neuron development and repair, and brain-derived nootropic factor to promote their survival of existing neurons and encourage growth of new synapses. Non-GMO advanced nootropic formula features clinically studied ingredients like Synapsa for peak cognitive performance, Cognizant for mental energy, focus, and attention, and clinically proven in extra so you can stay extra sharp. In fact, you may experience an improvement in alertness for up to five hours. As always, 
All V Thrive, the Vitamin Shop brand products, are simply clean with no magnesium, stearic, stearic acid, or titanium dioxide. Advanced Nootropic Formula comes with a quality promise you can trust with ingredient purity and potency verified by independent third-party labs. The best part? It's on sale. Save 15% on purchases of $40 or more when you use code STARTALK at vitaminshop.com today. Again, that's 15% off purchases of $40 or more with code STARTALK on vitaminshop, S-H-O-P-P-E dot com to expand your mental universe today. Are you always taking care of your family? Do you often take care of others and not yourself? Well, now is the time to take care of yourself because you deserve it. Teladoc gives you access to licensed therapists to help you get back to feeling your best, to feeling like yourself again. Sometimes we don't know how much we need to talk to somebody. Take it from me personally. During the entire pandemic, I have had virtual sessions and it has been such an incredible help. Now with Teladoc, you can speak to a licensed therapist by phone or video. Therapy appointments are available seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. local time. Hey, maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe you feel stressed or anxious or depressed or lonely, or you might be struggling with a family issue. Teladoc can help. No need to wait months to get a therapist. Teladoc is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy to change counselors if needed for free. Teladoc therapy is available through most insurance or employers and individual plans are also available. Download the app or visit teladoc.com slash startalk today to get started. T-E-L-A-D-O-C dot com slash startalk. Hey, I'm Roy Hill Percival, and I support Star Talk on Patreon. Bringing the universe down to Earth, this is Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Welcome back to Star Talk. In this special Cosmic Queries edition, in partnership with Pocket Land, it's drawn from a live stream that occurred recently. And in it, we field the questions from educators around the world. Check it out. All right, let's okay. keep it moving. Um, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's switch gears and come back to the United States. We'll not come back. Our first U.S. question. This is David Wilkerson uh, from Kentucky. And David would like to know this. He's a science teacher. He says misinformation is so prevalent in the media. Uh, how can science teachers better train students to see through the noise? This is a great question and an important question. And so I, I'm still, I have ideas that are still in the oven right now, baking. So technically that makes them half baked <laughs> if I share them with you. So I'll just put some things out there. And like I said, I think I've said that before. If um, I, I still want to think more deeply about this, but I'll give you some of my early thinking that science needs simply needs to be taught differently, okay? Whoever was the generation of educators who said, science is this body of knowledge, and we need to impart that in you. What is a DNA molecule? What is a molecule? What is DNA? What is, you know, what is metabolism? What is, what are volcanoes? What, what is a, a combustion engine? This is knowledge, and that's an important aspect of science literacy. I don't want to lessen its value by what I say next. Let's retain that value, but add to it the understanding that science is a means of querying nature. Somewhere in there that got lost, okay? Science is a tool. It is a, it is a, it is a process of inquiry so that there's something you don't know and you ask yourself, how do I go about finding the answer to that. That is what science is. So the science denial that's going on is coming about because, I think, because people think of science as just this body of information, and they decide what the cherry-picking information, the way you might in other subjects. You might say, no, I don't think it happened there. I think it happened this way. You know, in science, science doesn't give you that latitude of denial, right? The law of gravity is not something that was just written by members of parliament, you know, 20 years ago. And if you gain three pounds, you know, three, 
two kilograms last week, you're not going to say, oh, I want to repeal the law of gravity because it somehow made me look fat, All right? This is, you don't have that option in science. And if you don't know the power and the objective truths that the methods and tools of science bring to you, you are susceptible to that way of thinking. So I don't know if you can go to adults and, you know, and, and convince them because they've already been through a system where they think that they can pick and choose what it is that they believe is true. So, but if science is taught as, here's something, if you wonder if it's true, investigate it. Don't say, well, that conflicts with my culture, my religion, my, my family values, therefore it must not be true. Oh, no, 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 that's not how the world works. And so, uh, I, so yeah, I, I'm still working on how this could be implemented, but the science standards are, I think it's missing some elements uh, of what science is wow. that could protect us as we go forward. So Very nice. Are. Very nice. There you go. That's a great answer. Let me um, answer questions faster so we can get through more of them because we have a thousand of them. And at this rate, we'll be here until the year 2025. So that's fine. I'm, I'm, you know, during these COVID times, I don't really have a lot to do. <laughs> you got this. Let's, so, uh, let's hope uh, COVID doesn't hang out that long. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go. Yeah. Let's hope. All right. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's get a little more personal with Michelle Nedslick from mm-hmm. Wayne, Michigan. And Michelle says, love you guys. What is the one thing you learned about yourself during the COVID quarantine? A little more personal here, Neil. But have you learned anything about Neil deGrasse yeah, I have. Tyson? Uh, I have. Uh, first of all, I don't mind spending a lot of time alone or in solitude or, or with family. Um, fortunately, we, we live in, a, our apartment has enough rooms, people can go to them and separate. Not, not because we have COVID, but if you, you know, you can get on each other's nerves. Plus, I don't have like three-year-old children, we used to, but I don't have three-year-old, five-year-old children running up and down creating the the... Uh, the the entropic <laughs> universe mm, wow. that they're so good at doing. Yes. So that that I don't. So I don't want to, my answer to to think less of the people who are actually trying to maintain their sanity. But I will say is that I, I was very I was very productive, uh, and but I I'm disappointed in myself because I wanted to be a little more creative. As much as it's difficult, if not impossible, to confess to ourselves or to each other, if you want to be more creative, you have to be less productive. I don't, you don't want that to be true, but if you think about it and think about your own life, it's true. Oh, no, you can say, oh, I got this many emails done today and I cleaned up and I did the laundry and I did, and, and look at how productive I was. Did you create anything? Did you have any new thoughts? No. No. And you know what new thoughts take? They, it requires being alone for a while, just like looking up at the ceiling and letting the, the, letting the food that you spent your life feeding your brain, letting that find new connections. Because what is a new idea? But old information connected in new ways. That's what a new idea is. And, but you know what is happening? Is people during COVID, they're binging TV shows. Okay, this is a stretch of hours that you could have sat there and maybe created something. By the way, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be Isaac Newton. You know, you could, you know, knit something new or or read a new book or something that takes your thoughts in a new place. A good TV can do that and a good movie can do that. But if that's all that it is, all right, then it's really you're sampling other people's ideas and not your own. Mm. So I, I was not as creative over this time as I wanted to be. And so I, and I, uh, and I'm going to try to see what I can do about that going forward. Mm. I'm always creative because I'm never productive. So there you have it. <laughs> there you have it. Uh, it's just all creativity all the time, baby. All the time. All creativity all the time. Just creating. Chuck, you have laundry on the ground. Have you, you took <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm like, that's not laundry. That's an extra bed now. <laughs> Creativity. Unless tomorrow's clothes, because it wasn't true. quite dirty enough to put in the hamper. <laughs> exactly. Right. All right. So let's, um, great question here. All right. This is Catherine Higgins. 
And Catherine is coming from, to us from... Do we know where they're from? Do they say where they're from? He's coming to us from Spokane, Washington. Spokane, okay. Spokane. Here's what she says. If you could know the answer to one question about the universe, what would it be? You only get to pick one I got that. I got that. I got that. It really? Is. So you've thought about this already? Oh, yes, all the time. <laughs> Jesus. Go for it. <laughs> so uh, I, I lose sleep wondering whether we humans, who are basically the first intelligent species of life on Earth, you can define the word intelligence so that that's true. Okay, so we're the first ones to have music and poetry and art and science all together. Okay, no other, nobody else has done that. And to build stuff, okay? So we sit alone in that category if you define it that way. Okay, if we are the very first species to have that ability, who are we to think that we have sufficient intelligence to contemplate all the complexities of the universe. Imagine a world where there are multiple intelligent species and some are way more intelligent than others. Some might be more intelligent compared to humans than we are compared to chimps. What do you know what chimps look like to us? Okay. Yeah. They can stack boxes and reach a banana and they can use a stick and get termites and and we say, that's a smart chimp, and they're using tools. Right. Yeah, but they didn't build an airplane, okay? So, <laughs> so you can praise them, right. but they kind of really know better than our toddlers, what our toddlers can do. But if you find another species that's to us what we are to chimps, what do we look like to them? What, what, what do their toddlers look like? Their toddlers would be smarter than our smartest human beings. Right. When I joke about this, their toddler comes home, and said, oh, look, mommy, look what I did. Oh, Junior, uh, uh, Sissy, what did you do? Oh, you composed a sonnet. Oh, you derived the first laws of calculus. That's so cute. Let's put it on the refrigerator door for grandma to see. This, that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can imagine that increment of intelligence above us, what are they figuring out? That we're not. Right. That we are just, that we are just, our most complex thoughts are incapable of even knowing what question to ask. That's what I wonder, and I lose sleep. Not every night, but certainly weekly, I think of that. Wow. So, I mean, the real deal is, for me, um, uh, I, don't, I don't mind if, there are, if we're far down on the intelligence quotient. Um, I just don't want us to be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, it's okay if aliens come here and look at us like we are much lesser beings, but I don't want them to come here and look at us the way we look at cows. That, right. that would bother me. You don't want to be tasty. I don't want to be tasty. Aliens. That's it. I'll be stupid, but I don't want to be stupid. You can even be their pet. They can make us their pet. If they're smart enough, they'll just completely trick us into being their pets. And we wouldn't even know the difference, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so I just, I just wonder. And so as we contemplate the cosmos, and forget any one individual being smart. I'm talking about collectively, the human species. Right. Is the wiring of our brain sufficient? And I worry that it's not. And so and yeah, that's, that makes me sad. It could be that we're not capable of carrying the information necessary to know what is knowable. Or to even know what question to ask that would then later be answered. Wow, yeah. Just think about that. That's Not even knowing right. the question. Yeah. Okay, so a chimp won't even know how to ask, what's the square root of two? Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, what is cosine of 45 degrees? That, that question is so beyond every, uh, every uh, other primate. Okay, it's beyond some human primates. Okay, but but nonetheless, that's even a question that has no meaning to them. That's what I wonder. Cool. So that's my answer. All right. All right. Are we smart enough to figure out the universe? Excellent. Or should we just give up now and wait till some other smarter creature makes us their pet? 
Well, no, that that can't be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you don't that, want it to be. That, the answer. that certainly can't be it. <laughs> you don't want it. <laughs> All right, let's um keep it coming. Let's, let's go to Stefania Gonzalez in Mexico, who says, "How do you deal or manage the contradictions between religion and science in the classroom if children were to ask you?" So, if somebody were to ask you a question that certainly has religious implications, how do you give them a scientific answer? Yeah, so uh, in a free country, we have free expression of words and ideas provided that they don't conflict with other people's freedoms. That's a a common way you would think of what it means to live in a free country. Um, You should have the freedom to worship whoever you want in whatever way is is it fulfills the traditions of your family, your culture, uh, or, or your community. And so that, uh, at least in the United States, that's protected. It's protected. So you can have a stretch of road where there's a mosque, a synagogue, a Catholic church, some Protestant churches. Um, you can even might find a Scientology, you know, uh, uh, building down the street. So, that's protected. Um, religions, m- the tenets of most religions are not based on what is objectively true. It's based on what you might say is a personal truth. Okay, so if Jesus is your savior, that's your personal truth. No one in a free country can or will or should take that away from you. But that doesn't mean it's somebody else's savior. Okay, so now you have someone who worships differently from you. And now you put them both in the same classroom. So my response to you is, if that classroom is a science classroom, you teach the objectively true um, uh, realizations of what, how the universe works. And that is true no matter who you worship, okay? And so, and by the way, you don't have scientists going in front of places of worship saying, you know, that might not necessarily be true. That's not, that's not how you do it. That's not what anyone has done, Okay. You don't even find ardent atheists doing that, okay? The, the issue is just what the question um, pivoted on. What do you do in the science classroom, okay? So what you can say is whatever is, again, I'm not telling you to do this, but how I would handle the situation is I would say, if a religion or a holy book makes a testable statement about the world, we can test it using the methods and tools of science. If it turns out to be false, then that's the reality of the world you're living in. You're living in a world where the science gives you smartphones. It gives you means of communication, means of transportation. It has established what you accept and recognize as modern civilization. So you would need to go back to your religion and say to yourself, okay, do I need to reject the science because I believe in this religion so strongly? Or do I sort of think of my religion differently as a place for spiritual enlightenment, spiritual fulfillment, as a sense of community? You can do that without declaring the universe was made in six days. You can do that. And most enlightened religious people do. So there's a huge intermediate place in there for you to land between rejecting all of science because it conflicts with your religion or rejecting all of religion just because uh, you believe in something that is itself not testable. That's a lot of words coming out out of my mouth. You know, if you want to be like simple about it, you could just say, this is a science class. You're going to be learning about science. And uh, later on, when you're older, you can think this through for yourself and what makes the most philosophical sense to you. And we live in a free country. You have that freedom. But I'm not going to tell you something that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is not otherwise scientifically established. Well, I think that you really that's hit... that's the science classroom. I think you really hit the, 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 the crux of it in, the, in your first statement when you said there are personal truths and there are right. objective truths. Right. And, and by the way, if, you're gonna, if, you, if you rise to power of, of where you control laws and legislation and you have a, a, a country or community that is diverse, 
in belief systems and what people want and care about and, and who they love and who they, what they look like. If you're diverse and you're going to make laws, it seems to me the most um, secure way to make laws is to base the laws on what is objectively true because that applies to everybody. Mm. And I've said before, you know, the good thing about science, and I mean the ex- objectively true established science from experiment and observation, the good thing about science is it's true whether or not you believe in it. Boom. So a law then matters on all scales at that point. So when I think of establishing governments and laws if in a diverse country, you kind of have to anchor them in things that everyone can recognize is true whether or not you wanted it to be true. Cool. All right, let's, let's stay in North America and go to Guadalajara. And um, this is... Alejandro Salazar, who says, what features does a cool teacher need to have? Oh, I love that question. I love that question. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about you all here, okay? Uh Uh-oh. So, just, just, are you seated? Uh Uh-oh. Don't get me started. Should I get out a book? Are we about to be read? Don't make me do this. I'm going to do it. You ready? Okay. Okay. Okay, Um, I've seen the curricula in schools of education. I've seen it, okay? Maybe not every bit of it, but from what I've seen, what is commonly trained, well, train you to be organized, good. Train you how to give an exam where the questions are not ambiguous, or they're good. How to give homework, how to grade, how to to mechanically create the perfect classroom environment, okay? Fine, you'll be a better teacher for knowing that. But you will never be a great teacher. Just I'm telling you that, okay? And, 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 and how, how do I know this? Because I have never, ever met anybody who said, that class was awesome. I said, why? The exams were so perfect and the homework was so considered. No, nobody ever said that ever about any class they ever took, okay? What do they say about their favorite classes? I love the teacher. The teacher was enthusiastic. They made me want to learn. They made, they had expertise that came from every, all places and they put it together in fresh, interesting ways. And how many teachers in our lives satisfied those criteria? I bet it's like this many. By the way, I don't have to ask you because I know, because I poll people and I ask them out of the scores of teachers you've had in your life, how many were singularly interesting to you? How many changed your life? How many opened your eyes? There's like three, at most five, but it typically fits in one hand. So who are these teachers? These these are teachers who take their enthusiasm and forgive me for using the word in a COVID climate, and their enthusiasm is infectious. Okay, they breathe on you, oh, and no. they spread their infectious. Don't breathe on me. Their, their infectious love of their subject. Okay, and the rest is, yeah, it helps if you're organized and you got the thing, but don't you want to make lifelong learners out of people? Don't you want people to want to continue learning about the subject you just taught them? Rather than at the end of the day or at the end of the season say, school's out and throw their papers in the air. And I'm saying, what? What are you doing? Oh, I'm glad school is out because it was a chore. Nobody ever said that about their favorite classes and their favorite classes have people. So it's not about being cool. It's about being interesting. It's about, it's about meeting them more than half, their students, meeting them more than halfway in their spheres of curiosity. Because otherwise, what are you doing? You're standing in front of a chalkboard or whatever the board is made of today. You're standing in front of it and you're writing, facing the other way. And you say, if they don't learn, oh, the students don't want to learn today. No, no, don't ever say that. I will never accept that as an answer. Okay. By the way, I've said that publicly and people say, oh, he's never been a teacher. Excuse me. Go look at my resume. It's online. Okay. Forget the wiki page. I don't know who ever writes wiki page. My homepage. Go look. Okay. Okay. So, so again, I'm screaming again. I told right, you somebody, you why, why are you making, turning me into this? I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I like to see you get worked up. I like to see you get worked up. <laughs> Especially about this. That's great stuff, man. I mean, that is great stuff. 
We've got to take another quick break, but when we come back, we will introduce you to one of the co-founders of Pocket Lab, who has a few more questions to ask Chuck and me. So you're ready to earn your degree, but you need a university that works with your schedule. Well, WGU and their programs are built to be flexible. WGU offers a quality degree program that's affordable and even makes it possible to graduate faster. Plus, you can earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree for under $8,700 per year. Fees included. That's right. You heard me. That is the correct. It's not. Nope. $8,700 per year. Let your experience and dedication help you earn your degree faster. See what WGU's competency-based programs can offer you. With no set login times and 24-7 access to most coursework, you can really earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree on your own schedule. The low tuition rate covers as many courses as you can complete each term. That means the faster you learn, the more you'll save. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash star talk that's wgu.edu slash star talk for your 65 five dollar application fee poof gone waived with masterclass you can learn from the world's best minds anytime anywhere at your own pace learn how to ace your opponent from serena improve your writing skills with neil gaiman learn how to negotiate with chris voss all right Those were the courses I chose, but you'll have over 90 classes to make your own choice, and they're all taught by world-class instructors. Now, of course, the master instructor, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, has a masterclass of his own on scientific thinking and communication, and we all know how important that is in these times. I'm not the only one who's benefiting from my masterclass. My brother is an avid tennis player, and I sent him the gift of a subscription so he could get schooled by Serena. Did I tell him that it was a part of my subscription? Well, let's just say the answer rhymes with ho, ho, ho. From learning how to write anything from a book to a screenplay, to communicating with your boss, to how to make dinner worthy of a Michelin star or just the best scrambled eggs this side of a jumpy chicken, there's a master class for you. I'm in the middle of a course on sex and communication because I'm good at one of those things. Master class is accessible on your phone, web, or smart TV. You can get an annual membership to master class and give one to someone else for free. Get unlimited access to every master class for you and a friend right now. Just go to masterclass.com slash star talk radio. That's masterclass.com slash star talk radio. Hey, it's time for a Patreon shout out to Kyle Marston, Fareed El Nasir, and Steve Lindauer. Thank you so much, guys, for your support. Without you, it'd be so difficult to make Star Talk a reality, at least in this dimension. And for those of you who want your very own Patreon shout out, it's so simple. You just go to patreon.com slash Star Talk Radio and support us. <laughs> Welcome back to Star Talk, the third and final segment of our Cosmic Queries, brought to you in collaboration with Pocket Lab. And in this segment, we'll meet David Baker, who's co-founder of the organization, and Clifton Roosboom. He's a mechanical engineer turned educator, and they each have some questions for me and Chuck about what it is they want to do as educators. Check it out. So, Dave, Mr. Co-founder of Pocket Lab. Dude. Hey, it's great to see you guys. Thank you. That is, that is pretty entertaining. So, Dave, you got other questions. What do you, you bring to the table? I do have other questions. You know, but, but, you know, and first, though, I have a complaint. You know, um, 2020 has been going so great for everyone. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> just kidding. Um, you know, as if anything could go worse in 2020, a week ago, I see a headline that says, Neil deGrasse Tyson says an asteroid is going to hit Earth. And that's all the headline says, right? <laughs> okay. First of all, that's not what I said. All right? well, that's, that's right. The, that's I, the, I know that's not what you said. but that, I'm That's the it. arc of exaggeration that unfolds after a simple scientific statement is made. What I said was... We're all going to die. That's what he said. <laughs> His exact quote was, we're all going to die. And then they... No, if you're going to say that, it's got to be, we're all going to die. You got to say it with some panic, right? So... 
there is an asteroid the size of a refrigerator headed towards Earth, and there's a chance on the day before the U.S. presidential elections that it will buzz cut Earth. And buzz cut, I don't know if that expression is common internationally. It's, it's a close, you know, a cut with the clippers, but there's still a little bit of hair standing on end after you've done it. So we call that a buzz cut. And you're not quite bald after a buzz cut. They can leave a little bit of hair there. So it could be buzz cut. But if it does hit Earth, it's, it will be harmless to us. That's what I said. But that became Tyson predicts that we're going to get slammed by, an, you know. And so but what I made it clear is because it's harmless at that size, even though it's moving very fast, and it, if it hits, it will explode in the atmosphere, be visible to anyone in view, even in broad daylight. And there'll be some rocks that make their way down, remnants of that explosion. Yes, all that will happen. But it's not going to disrupt the grid. Nobody's going to die. Um, and so I made it clear. If, day, if the universe ends in 2020, it will not be the fault. <laughs> not be the no, 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 if, if, no, no. If Earth ends in 2020, it will not be the fault of the universe. That's right. All. So, and, but the good thing is, if we do get hit by an asteroid the day before the presidential election, the good thing is we will then have to elect a president that we can all agree upon, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Morgan uh, Freeman. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were remembering him as president from the movie um, Deep Impact. Deep Impact, yes. One of the best portrayals of a president I have ever seen yes. was his portrayal in that movie. It yes. was dignified. It was intelligent. He was, took care of business. He gave the right speech at the right time. And so if anyone has seen, want to see their examples of presidents throughout, you know, our American movie history, that's one of the best ones. 1996, I think it was, or 97, a deep impact. Came out within a year of Armageddon, uh, which where Bruce Willis saves the world. And uh, that movie, by the way, has more violations of the laws of physics per minute than any other movie ever made. Just so right. you know. Good, good. It, you know, it must be hard for you to enjoy movies because the most of them do, right? <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm okay. no, no, wait, Dave, Dave, no, uh, it's it's not hard for him to enjoy movies. It's no. hard for you to enjoy watching a movie with him. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Not, <laughs> no, I, I, I am good. I'm polite. I'm, okay. I, I'm okay in a the movie theater. I'm not as okay. bad as the people who read the book first. Those yeah. are the people oh, the who way. should yeah. never see movies because the they're never happy with their movie. Oh, they left this out. It's in the book. And, well, get the hell out of it. I don't need you here. I'm right. like, can I watch my movie, please? Go back home to your book. By the way, I just want to now go to a movie theater with Neil and have him scream out just, that is factually incorrect. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? That, the laws of physics are being violated, people. <laughs> this could never happen. Like, that would just be the best. No, I just silently chuckle when I see it. But what what, what are you saying, Dave? Well, Chuck, that would be a nerd's version of Rocky Horror, right? Yes, exactly. Are you speaking out to the Rocky Horror Picture Show? Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Cool. So, yeah, I do do have an important question. So for teachers who are teaching science, what is the best way to get science concepts across the students? Like, what is the... Yeah, concepts are harder because concepts are not objects. Right. Yeah. So if you're teaching geology, so here's earth and here's a volcano and here's lava and here's this. And so it concepts are are um, they're an extra sort of step on the pedagogical pyramid for you to it's an extra challenge for how to convey it. And mm-hmm. while I try to I use my hands a lot, you might have seen when I gesticulated an eclipse. You know, I think I have pretty expressive hands. I think I get pretty far. But if you have tools in your classroom, models of things, then then you don't have to be so inventive with your hands. The thing is there, and your hands could try to be inventive with the thing that you don't have a model of, right? So, and I, I understand you guys have, have such models. You, 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 they're in your storefront. But I'm just saying, um, when I think of a teacher's utility belt, walking around explaining things. Um, if you're in a classroom, your utility belt is what lines the walls. Those are your tools. And the more of those tools you have and the more informed you are on how to uh, invoke them, I think the more potent you can be in communicating the concepts. And so, yeah, 
Yeah. In fact, in fact Clift is on, on the line here. So Clifton. So are. Clift, one of the uh, engineers for, uh, for Pocket Lab. What kind of engineer are you? Mechanical engineer by training. Uh, and, but, you know, science educator by night. And oh, okay. Bruce Wayne by day. Yeah. Batman yeah. by night. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the, the skills of modeling, like you just touched on and, and how we can apply that in our science classroom. So I, I would say that one of the, one of the cautions or just, it's not a caution. It's just be actively self-aware that when you model something, there are some students who will think that you are describing the literal thing. Okay. And I don't know what, is it one in 10, one in 20, but there'll it be at least one or a few students in your class that will not get the, the metaphor of what you're using or the analogy of what you're invoking. And so, and by the way, that's where model breaks down, right? A, a model is not the exact thing. It's a model of the thing. And so you can, Pursue the model until you have a breakdown in that correspondence, and then they have to be self-aware of that, or you bring in a, a better model. So, is starting with the phenomena a good way to to get around the, the limitations of models? Yeah. So, I don't know. In my experience, I like explaining an idea first, seeing how far I get. Let them chew on it a little bit. You know. And if it's not tasty enough, I'll throw in some special sauce, which might be a pop culture analogy or a life experience, uh, something that adds a storytelling dimension so that I get their interest. And then they're grappling with the idea, what do you mean the, the sun covers the earth, the, the moon covers the sun? Huh? What, what is that? I'm trying to think this through. And when, you, when they've invested a little bit of that, then you bring out the model. Mm. Oh, that's what you mean. Oh, now I see. All right. So, but if you lead with the model, then the model itself can become a distraction to the yeah. idea. I like trying, it's my personal, I like trying to put the idea and let people struggle a little. Nothing wrong with struggling. Nothing wrong with trying to figure it out. Mm. Then the model gets put out and then it becomes crystal clear. In my field, astrophysics, I have colleagues who gave slideshows every day when they taught because we have a highly photogenic field, okay? Astrophysics, everything is beautiful, all right? Even the ugly stuff is beautiful. So they'd have slideshows, and this is what we're gonna learn about today. You know, if you show something that you haven't learned about, it's just a pretty picture. Mm. I saved slideshows for the last day of class. And I said, okay, and here's, here is the planet Mars, and notice it's red. Yes, we learned about that. It's red because it's iron oxides, and because we learned that in the chemical part of it. Oh, my gosh, yes, now I see. Thank you. And it's cold on the poles. Oh, it's got ice caps, just like we talked about, okay? And then all of a sudden, the model becomes the, the it cements it in place. And then they've got the idea, they've got the model that supports the idea, rather than the model itself that becomes the idea. That's just, that's just me. You pick up on that however it fits your classroom. Hmm. I think that's strong advice. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really like that. We, we talk about that a lot. We probably talk about this all day. You know, and the, the problem with the internet is, you know, you could just Google it and you lose that option, to, that opportunity to think about it. And try to, to think about it. Yeah, Googling is like a replacement for, you know, I was going to have a new rule because when people get into an argument, they say, well, let's Google it. I have a new rule. No. The, the, argue you know, about it for at least five yeah, yeah. minutes, ideally 10 minutes. Argue. That forces you to think, well, am I, are my thoughts correct? Oh, you have, you made a good point. Let me reassess that. Yeah. After 10 minutes, then Google it. Okay? And by the way, you'll get to learn whether the loudest person was correct. <laughs> 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 or whether the, the, the overtalkers, like the, the male overtalkers, whether they're actually correct or just where they're just full of hot air but you give them a chance to commit to something that they either know or don't know in the 10 minute argument. Then you, then you Google. That's how, that's my new rule. This is great. Uh, Chuck and Neil and Star Trek. Thank you so much. Uh, again, it's fantastic to have you. Dave, you're doing, you, you're doing great work there. And any, any person who can bring together 10,000 teachers in a coherent uh, way where everyone is, on the same side of the same fence trying to do what's right for this world 
um, you know, we need more folks like you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you can be a part of it. This has been Star Talk, and I've been Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And I want to thank my co-host, Chuck Nice, as well as Pocket Lab for co-sponsoring this edition of Cosmic Queries. As always, I bid you to keep it up. So you're ready to earn your degree, but you need a university that works with your schedule. Well, WGU and their programs are built to be flexible. WGU offers a quality degree program that's affordable and even makes it possible to graduate faster. Plus, you can earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree for under $8,700 per year. Fees included. That's right. You heard me. That is the correct. It's not. Nope. $8,700 per year. Let your experience and dedication help you earn your degree faster. See what WGU's competency-based programs can offer you. With no set login times and 24-7 access to most coursework, you can really earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree on your own schedule. The low tuition rate covers as many courses as you can complete each term. That means the faster you learn, the more you'll save. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash star talk that's wgu.edu slash star talk for your 65 dollars application fee poof gone waived with masterclass you can learn from the world's best minds anytime anywhere at your own pace learn how to ace your opponent from serena improve your writing skills with neil gaiman learn how to negotiate with chris voss all right Those were the courses I chose, but you'll have over 90 classes to make your own choice, and they're all taught by world-class instructors. Now, of course, the master instructor, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, has a master class of his own on scientific thinking and communication, and we all know how important that is in these times. I'm not the only one who's benefiting from my master class. My brother is an avid tennis player, and I sent him the gift of a subscription so he could get schooled by Serena. Did I tell him that it was a part of my subscription? Well, let's just say the answer rhymes with ho, ho, ho. From learning how to write anything from a book to a screenplay to communicating with your boss to how to make dinner worthy of a Michelin star or just the best scrambled eggs this side of a jumpy chicken, there's a master class for you. I'm in the middle of a course on sex and communication because I'm good at one of those things. Master class is accessible on your phone, web, or smart TV. You can get an annual membership to master class and give one to someone else for free. Get unlimited access to every master class for you and a friend right now. Just go to masterclass.com slash star talk radio. That's masterclass.com slash star talk radio. That's masterclass.com slash star talk radio.